the Soviet army launched its Operation Bagration, the Germans were completely taken by surprise. Within a matter of weeks, the Soviets had created an irrecoverable gap. This gap seriously endangered the Narva bridgehead. When a new Soviet threat in front of Narva became apparent, German High Command agreed that it was time to pull back. The southern flank of the 18th Army was attacked on the 11th of July 1944 by the Second Baltic Front, and they were forced to pull back from the Marienburg defensive line. On the 24th of July, it was the turn of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps. The 3rd Baltic Front, which consisted out of a dozen divisions, started their final assault on Narva. The Germans of Army Group Narva had anticipated the attack and had already started its withdrawal on the 23rd, one day prior to the Soviet offensive. The Soviets came up with a two-pronged attack in an attempt to encircle the Germanic SS Panzer Corps. The southern pincer of the offensive was already across the Estonian River just south of Vaivara. The pincer movement was clearly felt by the 11th Infantry Division which bore the brunt of the Soviet attack. Despite the masses of infantry and tanks, the German Infantry Division managed to keep the attackers at bay, although just. To the north of Narva, the Soviets attacked to create their northern pincer. After an incredible artillery barrage, the Soviets attacked at Rigi Hungerburg, where the 20th Estonian SS Division was defending. The Soviets broke right through and the Estonians were compelled to retreat, enduring heavy losses. The retreat opened the gap for the Soviet attackers and the situation for the Germans became critical. While the Soviets had launched their offensive, the Germans were still preparing their new Tannenberg defensive line. The first unit to arrive at the new positions were the Flemish volunteers of the 6th SS Sturmbrigade Langemark. They were rushed in from training and its reformation, as the unit had already endured immense losses earlier in the year. Under the command of SS Hauptsturmführer Rehmann, the Flemish battalion took up positions near an abandoned orphanage building on top of one of the three hills at Sinemaed. The hill was quickly baptized as Orphanage Hill. The first units to start the withdrawal from the Narva bridgehead were the Denmark Regiment, Lesset's 7th Company, and the 1st Battalion of the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 49, the Reuter. Both formations withdrew at 11.30pm on the night of the 24th of July. Both units withdrew across the bridges without any incidents. Following the Denmark and the 1st Battalion of the Dreuter were the men of the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 48, General Seyfar, and the 2nd Battalion of the Dreuter. They were covered by the 7th Company of the Danish Regiment. Of course, the units didn't retreat directly towards the Tannenberg Line. Each fighting force was designated with areas of retreat so that everything could go smoothly. Narva was held for another 24 hours before pulling back towards new positions. There were four main points of retreat before the 3rd SS Panzer Corps would arrive at the final destination, the Tannenberg Line and the Blue Hills. By midnight on the 25th of July, the final troops inside the Narva bridgehead had safely crossed the river. Early in the morning of the 25th, the Nordland's divisional staff retreated to the new positions. By 11am that morning, the new headquarters were set up at Saksama, just west of Vaivara. In the afternoon of the 25th, elements of the Denmark Regiment reached the railroad in the newly created Tannenberg defensive line. It was joined in the evening by the 7th Company, which had acted as a rear guard. The Norga Regiment joined up with Kampfgruppe Kausch in the evening. They were located on the Sipsu Road, north of the fourth and final point of retreat. Kampfgruppe Kausch consisted of two Estonian companies and the SS Panzer Abteilung 11, Hermann von Salza. The group was named after the commander, SS Obersturmbahnführer Paul Albert Kausch. To the north, still on the 25th of July, the Soviets continued their offensive at Rigi, where the Estonians desperately tried to hold them back. Despite the heavy losses, the Estonians managed to stall the Soviet offensive. In the early hours of the 26th, the bridges over the Narva were blown, apart from the main bridge inside the city itself, which had withstood the blast. The men of the Dutch SS Engineer Battalion 54 had to push back a Soviet assault on the bridge before new charges could be planted. After a few nerve-wracking hours, the final bridge was also blown up. The Estonians to the north were forced to retire and the Soviets had created the breakthrough they had been hoping for. With the desired breakthrough, the Soviets were now able to slowly encircle the retreating German forces. The Luftwaffe was called up to bomb the Soviet spearheads, but that didn't stop the steamroller from continuing the offensive. 
At noon on the 26th of July, Kampfgruppe Kausch found itself in a dangerous situation with Soviet trucks rolling past a command post. Two companies of the SS Engineer Battalion 11 had to be brought up to establish contact with Kausch's unit. Kampfgruppe Kausch wasn't the only unit to become surrounded. As the 4th SS Sturmbrigade Nederland retreated, its 2nd Battalion of the Dreuter became cut off. Regimental Commander Kolani quickly sent the 1st Battalion out to the rescue. After very stiff combat, the artillery units of the brigade and the 2nd Battalion of the Dreuter were reached and they were successfully extricated. Not all was good news for the Germans and Dutch. The initial phases of retreat went more or less as planned, the later stages, however, not so much. The SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 48, General Seyfar, was still dangerously encircled. SS Brigadeführer Wagner, commanding the Dutch Sturmbrigade, sent out his assault gun and reconnaissance companies to aid the regiment in breaking through. The rescuing force quickly ran into Soviet opposition and a bloody firefight ensued. The Dutchmen managed to knock out eight tanks, but in return the Germans lost two self-propelled guns. As the relieving force was not able to breach the Soviet lines, the General Seyfar Regiment was left to survive on its own. In the evening of the previous night, being the 25th of July, SS Obersturmbahnführer Benner, the regimental commander, decided to rest and wait for a detachment that lagged behind. This proved to be a fatal decision. By waiting, Benner had given the Soviet forces more than enough time to encircle his men. The regiment retreated to positions in the forest east of Repiknu, from where they tried to hold back the Soviets. All their efforts failed and between 2 and 5 pm, those who were still alive split up into different groups, trying to infiltrate the Soviet lines and walk back to safety. The SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 48, General Seyfar, had ceased to exist. Only a few stragglers made it out of the encirclement. An estimate of 80% of the regiment was lost. Benner, the commander, and the commander of the 1st Battalion were killed in the struggle. The regiment was removed from battle duties and in the autumn of 1944 it was rebuilt with new recruits coming from the Netherlands. By the end of the year it was back in combat. In the meantime at the Tannenberg Line, the retreating 3rd Battalion of the Norge Regiment was also temporarily cut off. The Denmark's 11th Company was successfully sent out to clear the way for their Norwegian comrades. The fighting on the 26th was far from over. To the north, a vital link-up was made with the men of the Estonian 20th SS Division. This way, the defensive line was sealed, eliminating any possible gaps through which the attackers could sneak through. The Nederland, in the meantime, would take over the Estonians' positions, whilst the Estonians, on their turn, would move further south. At noon on the 26th of July, the Soviets started to pummel the Tannenberg Line with artillery. Most of the fire was directed at Orphanage Hill, where the 1st Battalion of the 6th SS Sturmbrigade Langemark had taken up positions. Baptized as Kampfgruppe Rehmann, the Flemish had a dominant position with excellent fields of vision and fire. The Soviets, well aware of the importance of the position, made the hill a prime target for artillery. In the bombardment, the orphanage was completely destroyed and the Flemish unit endured heavy losses losing both SS Hauptsturmführer Rehmann and his adjutant SS Untersturmführer Svenen. Both officers were grievously wounded. Two company commanders were also killed and a newly appointed adjutant was mortally wounded. The command thus passed on to SS Untersturmführer Dase. After yet another nerve-wracking retreat, most of the 3rd SS Panzerkorps units were back in defensive positions. The Tannenberg defensive line was the last major defensive line before the rest of Estonia and its capital Tallinn. The country's main railway line ran through the southern part of the defensive system and a major highway was just a stone's throw away. The northern part of the defensive zone close to the coast was dotted with hills which favoured the defence. The centre of the line was marked by three prominent hills. We already saw the easternmost hill being Orphanage Hill. The middle of the three hills was the Grenadier Hill and the westernmost hill was called Hill 69.9. Hill 69.9 was used as headquarters by both the Norge and the Drote regiments. The Norge being on the southern flank and the Dutchman on the northern flank. The defences of the Tannenberg line were at an odd angle, making it harder to defend as the Soviets could pour fire in from both the east and the south. The northernmost unit was the SS Engineer Battalion 54 of the Nederland Brigade. They were positioned touching the Gulf of Finland. On their right were the men of SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 49, the Reuter. 
Their positions ran to just north of the main road. On the other side of the main road were the men of the Nordland Division with the 3rd Battalion SS Grenadier Regiment 24 Danmark, the 2nd Battalion of the Danmark, and the 3rd Battalion of the SS Grenadier Regiment 23 Norge. Touching the Norge on the right were the men of the 11th Infantry Division. Just behind the front line, Orphanage Hill was still being held by the 1st Battalion of the Langemark. Reinforcing them on the northern flank of the hill were several Flemish pack guns. The rest of the Nordland's engineers were, together with some Estonian troops, were located on Hill 69.9. Opposing them were the men of the 2nd Soviet Shock Army and 8th Army, with the 109th and 117th Rifle Corps around the Blue Hills and the 122nd Rifle Corps more to the south. When the Soviets blasted the defences with artillery on the afternoon of the 26th, it didn't only affect the Flemish volunteers on Orphanage Hill. The 3rd Battalion of the Denmark Regiment was also subjected to heavy shelling, resulting in quite a few casualties. Just after dark on the 26th, the Soviets started their first attack with the 201st and 256th Rifle Divisions. Armour support was provided by the 98th Tank Regiment. Five tanks accompanied by infantry were spotted on the main road heading towards the 3rd Battalion of the Denmark Regiment. The tanks and infantry broke through with relative ease and within a relatively short period, the eastern slope of Orphanage Hill was captured. Countermeasures had to be made to stem the new Soviet advance, and the 3rd Battalion Danmark quickly sent a few grenadiers forward. Armed with Panzerfaust and Panzerschreck anti-tank weapons, they created destruction among the attacking troops. Within minutes, more than 10 tanks were destroyed or knocked out. The first Soviet push was stopped, but the Soviet attack was only a prelude to what was yet to come. At 6am on the morning of the 27th of July, the Soviets bombarded the lines once more. Along the front line, shells came crashing down, creating chaos and destruction among the defenders. In the meantime, the few panzers that were still left were put under the command of SS Obersturmbahnführer Paul Albert Kausch's SS Panzerabteilung 11. The tanks were put in reserve to the south of Hill 69.9. At 9am, the Soviets resumed their attack. Some 30 T-34 supported by infantry rolled towards the Danish 10th and 11th companies, desperately defending the Tirzu road. The Soviet tank commanders came too close, as they came within reach of the handheld anti-tank weapons. 14 T-34s were claimed to have been destroyed, and the others retreated. Later in the day, both the 10th and 11th companies became surrounded. Both companies would continue the fight until they were practically destroyed. Not long after the two companies of the Denmark Regiment had been surrounded, the fighting entered the village of Schindunurk, from where it would spread to the 2nd Battalion of the Denmark Regiment and the 3rd Battalion Norge. The entire front of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps was soon fighting the Soviet attackers. When yet another big push was made on the line, the 3rd Battalion of the Denmark Regiment was overrun and the survivors were forced to retire to Orphanage Hill. The 1st Battalion of the Langemark were quickly ordered to counterattack. The men under SS Untersturmführer Daza fought a very chaotic and vicious hand-to-hand -hand battle. Meanwhile, on the northern flank of the hill, the back anti-tank guns of the Langemark Brigade had also seen better days. Among them was SS Unterschachführer Remis Hreinen, a Flemish volunteer. When the Soviets tried to push round the northern flank of the hill, the Flemish back 40s were manhandled into new positions to fire onto the oncoming tanks. In quick succession, six tanks were destroyed, four of them went up in flames. The Soviet attack faltered and the Flemish pack guns were given credit for it. Although the situation directly north of Orphanage Hill was taken care of, the struggle for the northern flank of Steiner's Corps was far from over. The 2nd Battalion of the Dreuther Regiment desperately clung on to its positions. Its commander, SS Hauptsturmführer Karl Heinz Frühhauf, was wounded. The Dutchman cracked under the pressure and at the Nordland's headquarters, SS Brigadeführer Fritz von Scholz ordered an armoured counterattack. Kausch ordered 12 assault guns to Grenadier Hill from where they managed to contain the immediate threat to the rear. The situation to the south of Orphanage Hill, however, was far from looking good to the Germans. The headquarters of the 3rd Battalion Denmark Regiment had become surrounded and a staff was desperately clinging on to the last buildings in which the command post was set up. The 7th Company of the Norga Regiment heard the cries of desperation through the radio and they counterattacked from the woods to the northwest of Schundinirk, relieving the headquarters of the Danish battalion. <laughs> 
The positions of SS Hauptsturmführer Heinz Hemel's 2nd Battalion Denmark weren't spared either. By noon on the 27th, his right-hand company was starting to collapse and reinforcements had to be called up to help the battered company. Rushing to the scene were the remnants of the 1st Battalion Waffen Grenadier Regiment of the SS-47 of the 20th Estonian SS Division. With the new reinforcements, Hemel was able to push the Soviets back, although he fell wounded. Although the counterattack at a 2nd Battalion's Denmark position was going well, nearly the entirety of the southeastern flank of Orphanage Hill fell into the hands of the Red Army. At noon on the 27th of July, a staff meeting was held at the Denmark Regimental Headquarters. Several senior officers of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps were present, SS Brigadeführer von Scholz being the most senior officer. After the meeting, the Nordland Division's commander von Scholz went out to inspect the nearby positions of the Danish 13th Company. Just as he was stalking to the company commander, a hellish bombardment came crashing down. Fritz von Scholz was mortally wounded by a shell fragment in the head and died later that day. Alter Fritz, as he was called by his troops, was posthumously promoted by Hitler, and he would also posthumously receive the swords to his knight's cross with oak leaves. The divisional commander might have been killed, but the battle for the Blue Hills was far from over. The 1st Battalion of the Estonian Waffen Grenadier Regiment 47 was called up to clear the southeastern part of Orphanage Hill. At the same time, two companies of the SS Engineer Battalion 11 would clear the eastern part of the hill. At 10pm, the attack commenced after a heavy mortar barrage. As soon as the Estonians crested the hill, they came into contact with the Soviet soldiers. Although the first moments provided hope for the attackers, after a period of heavy combat on the hill, the German counterattack disintegrated, leaving many casualties on the battlefield. Some units had advanced so far forward that they had an incredibly hard time trying to extricate themselves out of the perilous situation. The few survivors of the attack regrouped at the orphanage building, which had by then been reduced to rubble. As dawn set over the battlefield on the 28th of July, the 1st Battalion of the Estonian Waffen Grenadier Regiment 47 had ceased to exist, and those who were still fit for combat filled the ranks of the battered 1st Battalion of the Flemish Langemark Brigade. With SS Obergruppenführer Steiner back at the helm of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps, things had to change. Nearly every day a battalion ceased to exist during the bitter fighting for the Tannenberg Line. The biggest change was made to the Corps artillery. Rather than give a limited support to the various points that needed it, the order was given to mass the artillery and concentrate nearly every gun on the position that needed help the most. The artillery of the Nordland Division, the Netherland Brigade and the various Luftwaffe naval batteries were placed under the command of the Corps Artillery Commander, Oberst Kresin. By the 28th, the Soviets had already managed to repair or replace the damaged bridges over the Narva and the new reinforcements were arriving on the battlefield. Among the reinforcements of the 2nd Shock Army were the 31st and 82nd Tank Regiments. During the short lull in the fighting, the German units were hastily reorganized. SS Hauptsturmführer Bergfeld had taken over the command of the 2nd Battalion Denmark, as Hemel had been seriously wounded in the prior battles. SS Brigadeführer Joachim Ziegler took over the command of the Nordland Division, as Fritz von Scholz had been killed by a shell fragment the previous day. By first light on the 28th, the various nationalities in SS uniforms still held a part of the orphanage hill. As the previous attempts by the engineers and Estonians had failed, it was now the task of the 2nd Battalion Norga Regiment under SS Sturmbahnführer Scheibe to clear the hill of Soviets. After a short artillery barrage, the men and the Scheibe charged forward, only to be caught by the crashing shells of the Soviet artillery. The few that made it leapt into the Soviet-held trenches, and a vicious hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. When Scheibe fell wounded, the retreat was ordered. Yet again, the Soviet rifle divisions had withstood a counterattack. The Soviet 117th Rifle Corps on their turn followed the retreating infantry and managed to push the Norwegians and Estonians off of Orphanage Hill. The 3rd SS Panzer Corps was thus ordered to hold the next hill, Grenadier Hill. The various depleted SS units tried desperately to hold the Soviets back, but the Red Army soldiers continued their successful charge. Soon the eastern side of Grenadier Hill was well in Soviet hands. The Soviets, realizing they had left their southern flank open, quickly changed from attacking the Grenadier Hill to attacking the units still defending to the south. 
With the Soviet attention shifted to the south, the 9th Company of the Danmark at Chundinurk was quickly subjected to yet another Soviet attack with tanks and infantry. With the aid of the artillery, the Company of the Danmark, armed with Panzerfausts, managed to ward off the attack. Because the fighting was so chaotic for both sides, the Soviet tanks retreated back along the Chundiner Kirkukula road, close to the headquarters of the 3rd Battalion Danmark, where two assault guns were being kept in reserve. Both assault guns quickly prepared an ambush and within minutes several of the IS-2s and T-34s were set ablaze. As the main defensive line had collapsed, more and more units had become surrounded. Several scattered units of the Danish 3rd Battalion were reported to be surrounded, and the 7th Company of the Norga was sent out to rescue them. The Norwegians managed to stem the tide in some vicious fighting, and the 3rd Battalion was safe from utter annihilation. By noon on the 28th of July, most of the advancing Soviet elements had become bogged down. Nonetheless, the Soviets had had a rather successful attack, Orphanage Hill was captured and the southern defences were on the verge of collapsing. During the evening of the 28th, at around 5pm, seven Soviet tanks accompanied by infantry were seen heading towards Limbitu. The attack at Limbitu was destroyed by the artillery, but at the same time the Soviets were slowly surrounding Grenadier Hill. After being thrown back by the German artillery, the Soviets regrouped on Orphanage Hill, ready for a new attack. At sunset, 50 men of the 7th Danmark Company, together with 20 men of the Langemark, set off to harass the Soviet attempt to regroup on Orphanage Hill. However, the Red Army soldiers were already lying in wait, and the counterattack was destroyed by a small arms fire. The final attempt to recapture Orphanage Hill had failed. After three bloody days of incessant combat, General Govorov prepared his forces to make yet another final push. The next day, July 29, was to be the day that the Germans would be thrown off of their defensive Tannenberg line positions. As the third morning of heavy fighting for the Tannenberg positions dawned, the Soviets commenced their artillery barrage. The boots on the ground were to clear the ground between Grenadier Hill and Chundinurk in order to breach the lines of Steiner's SS Panzer Corps. Besides the heavy artillery bombardments, the Soviet Air Force also performed bombing raids on the defenders of the Tannenberg line. The Soviets were ready to launch the attack. Soon after, multiple dozens of tanks followed by infantry were seen coming towards the battered trenches. The German artillery tried desperately to stop the onslaught, but their attempts were to no avail. During the battle, Sergeant Fendeyev managed to destroy several German strongholds, and political organizer Lavreshin of the 937th Rifle Regiment managed to hoist a red flag over the Grenadier Hill. But at the end of the day, the hill remained in German hands. However, the 201st and 256th Rifle Divisions of Major Generals Yakutovich and Koziev, respectively, had become exhausted, and the 109th Rifle Division of Major General Nikolai Trushkin was left on its own to press towards the summit of Grenadier Hill. To the north were the men of SS Standartenführer Hans Kolani's SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 49, the Reuter. The Soviet 109th Rifle Corps managed to enter the trenches and defensive system of the Dutch regiment, and a vicious hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. As the IS-2s and T-34s rolled forward, the situation was getting worse by the minute. The regimental commander, Kolani, was so badly wounded that he decided to take his own life. By that time, the command post was on the verge of being overrun. Miraculously, the command post held out and Kolani was posthumously promoted Standartenführer. Still in the fight was the Flemish SS Unterschachführer Remis Hreinen, with his pack 40 now positioned on the northeastern flank of Grenadier Hill. Around 30 tanks were getting past the Dutch defences, but in quick succession, Hreinen single handedly managed to set three IS 2s ablaze. Another four tanks were also knocked out. In one occasion, Hreinen came face to face with an IS 2, and both cannons fired at the same time. Hreinen again got badly wounded, but he also knocked out the IS 2. For his actions during the fighting, von Narva Schreinen received a prestigious Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. On the Grenadier Hill itself, SS Hauptsturmführer Bachmeier, in command of the 2nd Battalion Norga Regiment, had everything more or less under control. His right flank, however, was getting ever weaker. To stiffen his defences, Bachmeier received a remnant of the 1st Battalion of the Flemish Langemark and some Estonian forces. In numerous small pockets, Bachmeier's force initially stood firm and managed to fend off the 109th Rifle Corps under the command of Major General Ivan Alferov. 
As the day wore on, more and more local breakthroughs were created by the Soviets, and the panzers had to be caught up in a last-ditch effort to turn the tide of battle. SS Obersturmbahnführer Paul Albert Kausch, commander of the SS Panzerabteilung 11, Hermann von Salza, was ordered to scrape together the remnants of his tank battalion. When they arrived on the battlefield, the Soviet armoured vehicles, which were harassing the defending infantry, quickly retreated. However, before they retreated, the Soviets had caused considerable casualties to the defenders. Starshina Shmirnov managed to destroy five German-held strongpoints in the process. As the armoured vehicles retreated, the Soviet infantry came charging down from the western flank of Orphanage Hill, straight towards the men of the 2nd Battalion Norga, who had been fighting non-stop as of the early hours of that 29th of July. As the Soviet and German infantry were bravely fighting it out in the many shell craters and various trenches which dotted the burnt landscape, Kausch's tanks soon rumbled on. They moved to the plain south of the Three Hills which was most suited for armour. As they entered the scene, a large tank-on-tank -tank battle occurred in which the Panther tanks of Kausch eventually prevailed, forcing the IS-2s and T-34s to retreat. As confusion reigned over the battlefield, a lot of the Soviet infantry retreated back to Orphanage Hill after seeing their armor support retreat. Once again, the lines of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps had stood firm, although severely battered and bruised. Bachmeier reorganized his Norga battalion and the units attached, and he gradually started to regain his lost positions. As night set on the 29th of July, most of Grenadier Hill was back in German hands. When the battle on the 29th of July reached its zenith, Steiner threw in his last remaining battalion, the 1st Battalion Waffen Grenadier Regiment 45 of Sturmbahnführer Paul Meitler. Together with the last remaining Panther tank, the battalion reached the Grenadier Hill summit, from which the Soviets subsequently retreated. The 29th had seen the culmination of several days of hard fighting, but the end of the Tannenberg Line battle was in sight. During the three days of frankly incessant fighting, the Soviets lost 113 tanks. The once beautiful three hills were turned into a lunar-like landscape with craters littered across the battlefield. Trees were smouldering and the many dead and wounded were still lying where they had fallen. It was like hell on earth. The Soviets managed to bite a chunk of the initial defences, but the cost on both sides had been incredibly high. The following day, July 30th, would see new attacks. Fortunately for the defenders, these weren't as brutal as the previous days of fighting had been. Between Tirzu and Alferi, the oncoming tanks were quickly repulsed, thanks to the artillery and Luftwaffe. In the three previous days of fighting, two Stukadai bombers had been shot down. On the 30th of July, the defences of the 2nd Battalion, the Röte Regiment, were once again tested by the Soviet attackers. SS Obersturmführer Scholz and his men managed to fend off the attack by using Panzerfausts to scare off or knock out the advancing tanks. By the morning of the 31st, the size of the Soviet attacks had reduced so much in strength that they didn't really pose that much of a threat anymore. The remnants of Bachmeier's defending force who held Grenadier Hill managed to fend off two attacks with relative ease. In the afternoon, however, the defending Estonians, Danes, Norwegians, Belgians and Germans were startled by a new Soviet artillery barrage. After the 20-minute barrage, the Soviet infantry hopped out of their trenches and charged towards the defenders. Bachmeier called up his few remaining reserves and counterattacked. When night fell, the trenches were regained and the battlefield became silent once more. On the 1st of August, the Soviets didn't attack. They used the hot summer day to reorganize and replenish their units. For five full days they had tried to break the Tannenberg Line. Although they managed to gain possession of Orphanage Hill, they still hadn't captured Grenadier Hill, let alone Hill 69.9. For both the Soviets and the Germans, a day of respite was more than a welcome gift. Ammunition could be brought up, units could be reorganized, and perhaps the most important thing of all, the dead could be buried. The next day, the 2nd of August, a crackling noise of gunfire heated up once more. Once again, the Soviets tried to dislodge Bachmeier and his men from their defences on Grenadier Hill. For his actions during the Tannenberg defensive operation, Bachmeier would be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. During the next few days, the Soviets tried to capture the central hill, but all attacks were in vain. The 3rd SS Panzer Corps stood firm. On the 12th of August of 1944, the Soviets finally changed their tactics. Rather than attacking head-on, they changed to performing small-scale but deadly raids. 
The small forces of Soviets initially managed to infiltrate the lines, but when they were discovered, they were easily pushed back. By then, the infantry action was reduced to a minimum, and most of the fighting came from the artillery units on both sides of the front line. The Battle of the Tannenberg Line slowly but surely came to a close, and so did the battle for Narva. The fighting had been incredibly costly for both sides, whole battalions were wiped out for the gain of hardly a metre of ground. Some sources mention that the Germans were outnumbered by 6 to 1, but despite this number disadvantage, the volunteers had put up a staunch defence. The Soviets were left with a bitter aftertaste when they finally gained possession of the Blue Hills in September 1944, during the Riga Offensive. The numbers are dreadfully difficult to establish, but some sources mention 10,000 German casualties for 170,000 Soviets. Either way, it was a battle in which both sides showed great courage, and in which the Germans eventually prevailed only to withdraw from the hills later that year. This was the Ace Destroyer, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. If you want to see more Narva themed videos, why not watch my Narva 1944 series, starting at the Oranienbaum front and ending at the Tannenberg line. I hope to catch you in another video. Cheers!